Welcome back, Patrizzi. Shout out Robert for that name. Um, for the Patreon fans. Patreon, Breezy fans, Patrizzi. Smooth. I love it. We're going to go with it. Hope everyone had a lovely Mother's Day. Let's roll into low power mode. I got an excess of black bile, high irascibility, contemplating checking myself into facility, mental ability, clearly affected, deep in the dumps, down and dejected, I've been in low, 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 low power mode, in low power mode, been in low power mode, all year, thing is time to switch it up to high gear, I've been in low, 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 I've been in low, I've been in, I've been in no power mode all year. Thing is, I'm to switch it up to high gear. Welcome back to Low Power Mode with Breezy, my weekly safe space to discuss music, TV, and film that lies at the intersection of black and queer POC, intersectional feminist, and all sorts of other transgressive experiences. Welcome back. Uh, super pumped about the artists we're going to talk about in music today. So let's go. Music. Okay, so in our music section today, we're talking about the one, the only Vince Staples. Vince Staples. Okay, so... Vince came back into into focus for me after a little while. I remember being when I was going to the University of Redlands um, and just so into Kendrick Lamar and uh, everyone on TDE on the label TDE. So like Schoolboy Q, SZA, Isaiah Rashad, all these incredible artists. Um, but there was also the like adjacent to Tyler the Tyler the Creator. There was like that odd future wolf gang, which I feel like I don't know if Vince Staples and Earl Sweatshirt were a part of that or like adjacent to it. But these artists all kind of came up around the same time. So Vince Staples, um, I remember loving his sound, his his voice. There's something so West Coast about just just his voice alone. Um, he's from Long Beach, California, LBC. Nor north side and um and yeah vince uh has just blossomed in this beautiful beautiful way like many of those odd future wolfgang folks and those west coast crews have you know tyler the creator being a, f a phenomenal example but vince staples dropped an album last month called ramona park broke my heart and it is so good. So as I said, I remember back in like blue suede days uh, of Vince Staples. And and this album is really mature. It's 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 still like gangster rap and it's still Vince Staples. But there's there is. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how else to say it. There's a maturity about it that I love. It's so smooth and Cali and classic while also sounding fresh. I feel like most of these tracks are are bangers, like just can stand up on their own. Um and it's it's uh it's emotional. It's it's deep, but in that Vince Staples way. So like one of my favorite things is when an artist is talking about really dark shit, but like kind of couches it in this like brighter atmosphere and I feel like for him there's certain sounds from west coast rap that are like I think of like the sun and driving around in a car and that sort of thing and um and so Vince I feel like has taken the formula but then been really honest about his experiences growing up you know in in gang gang uh, violence, but also humanizing people who live in the hood, in Long Beach, in Compton, in Watts. Like, it's very, um, even though the circumstances are, uh, uh, um, you know, 
dangerous and and there's a lot of shit that goes down there's so much love and family and beauty uh and i feel like he en encompasses those things within himself and within this album like it's beautiful i also feel like for cis men who like grew up in the hood maybe the, the or it's just the age of I don't know if this is an age thing or whatever, but I just, I feel like instead of trying to prove things where Vince is just, just doing him. And that's the best kind of artist for me. Like, especially when it comes to rap and hip hop, because as I've said on this podcast before, I feel like hip hop is in a weird space. But when I listen to this album, I'm like, yes, 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 yes. This is this is everything I need. This is everything I want. So I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about it. So another thing that was funny, I'm definitely going to add this link. Um, when I was visiting Groovy, he had this interview on and I kind of wasn't paying attention to it, but it was this interview with Vince Staples and some of the, some of the shit he was saying had me cracking up, but he was being so serious, but it was just certain <laughs> like, for instance, Vince doesn't like gifts. Like, don't give him a gift. He does not want a gift. He feels that it's, if someone gives him a gift, it's them trying to, it's it's for them. It's not for him. And so he, everyone in his life gives him gift cards <laughs> because then he can like get what he actually wants. And I thought that was so... <laughs> I don't know. He's just so unique and so particular in this beautiful way. Um, and yeah, so I highly recommend the interview. Um, I also, I'm starting to DJ now and it's important to look at like the different qualities of the tracks that, that you play during your set. So I was kind of like shopping around and seeing what, what was available besides just buying it off of iTunes. And um, and I love a good artist website as well. Vince Staples has such a great artist website. And something that stood out to me was the prices. Like he has a signed Ramona Park Broke My Heart exclusive CD, like signed CD on here for $12. Um, the digital copy of the album is on here for eight dollars and the album is a 16 track album itunes sells it for 9.99 so i love that he is selling it for less on his website i don't know it's such a small thing but i feel like vince stables has a shit ton of integrity in his artistic choices um something something else that i really liked was when you go on his website He's got um, an upcoming event that looks really dope. If I was in L.A., I would definitely go. Um, but then he's got the album cover, and he's got this little note um, here, and I'm going to read it. It says, I'm often told the lie that life is what you make it. For over a decade, most of my work has been an anthology of what I believed to be home. Now I've realized that it reaches beyond location. I've been exploring the utility of home security, comfort, meaning, the answer, the excuse. To outgrow is to love blindly no longer. Ramona Park broke my heart is the story of that growth. Vince. So that's kind of his artist statement. And I just love this vulnerability, this, this level of letting us in. Because so often in gangster rap, so often with cis men, it's about like this bravado and this this like, let me pretend that nothing's wrong. And he's saying, I know I grew up in like what I think what he's saying is home for me is complicated. And it there's so much beauty in home. And there's also there's also ways in which home can not be the the physical location. I don't know. It resonates a lot with me. So really really huge shout out to Vince Stables as an artist this song magic just a banger just definitely something to add to your playlist for the summer um but again 
it it's when you listen to it the first time or if you're like out with people and listening to it it's a bop like you definitely are going to want to dance and and get hyphy and all that but and of course it's a dj mustard produced you know collab song here so dj mustard similar to e40 um in the bay area with with hyphy and west coast rap like dj mustard is such a huge part of la sound um his his production uh has really like painted a lot of the the landscape of what hip hop sounds like in LA. So classic production style here and it just is a really feel good track. Like it's a really feel good song. But if you're listening carefully and you're reading between the lines, it's dark as fuck. <laughs> it's dark. It's dark. You know, and Vince talks about prison a lot. He talks about gun violence a lot. He's got some incredible um, uh, interludes as well on the album from probably Mom and like maybe Sis or there's there's it's just a masterpiece. Maybe maybe uh, no, because then I won't have enough characters when I put in my descriptions and stuff. But I was going to say maybe I'll just put Ramona Park Broke My Heart album with Vince Staples. But I already know I'm not going to have enough characters. So if you don't have time to fully get into the album, definitely put on magic. And the music video um, is, per it's like so, it gives you exactly who he is. Like exactly what I'm trying to say and explain the music video for magic is, is so good. It's so good. Um, I'm laughing not because it's like particularly funny, but it is funny when you take yourself out of it because the music video, he's showing up, he's in the very beginning, he grabs some frozen peas from the corner store and uh, talks about a house party down the street and he's like all beat up. And then we kind of like start from the beginning and he like goes like floating into this house party like he's definitely on some sort of thing where he's not walking he's floating it looks beautiful aesthetically bright colorful solo cups like funny moments and then he basically goes out to the backyard and it's like starting to talk to um starting to chat up um chat up a, a uh you know someone who's standing by the pool and then this group comes in and beats him up and he leaves the house party um, all beat up. And, and that that is that is such a great symbol for uh, not just life in the hood, but so many aspects of life where you just you go in hoping for the best and you you get spat out and you're beat up and bloody and bruised. Um, I know it sounds dark, but you got to watch it. You got to just see for yourself the magic of Vince Staples. So I could clearly go on for a while. I'm going to end it there and uh, we can roll on over into TV. All right, and we're back. So think back. How many years ago? Oh, my goodness. Think back to... 10 years ago, the year 2012. If you recall, Obama was still president. Still president? 12, because he was through, yeah, 16. Yep, yep, yep. So we were right in the middle of the Obama years. Oof. Do you remember that? Like, that we had a black man as president? <laughs> I feel like it's... It, it's it's decades ago that this was the case. Um, I mean, I guess it's a decade ago, but just the the mental health of the overall population was so much better during the Obama years. I don't need any census statistics reports to to say this. I think for all people all over the world. Every I think the world mental health was better during the Obama years. All right. So, today for TV, I'm talking about the one 
the only Key and Peel, the sketch comedy show done by none other than Michael Keegan, no, Keegan, Michael Key, and Jordan Peel. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, as you know, I love to take a successful artist and kind of like go back and see where, where they came from or, or their journey. And I think we all know Jordan Peele to be this like incredibly smart, talented, accomplished direct film director. Um, he's kind of known for this at this point, even more than his acting. So uh, let's take it back to where Jordan Peele was rocking like skater skater looks on tv like he would show up in cargo shorts and a t-shirt and like a button down like an open button down and s skater sneakers like every every episode that they came out to introduce clips it was so it's just so great to go back um these two they both worked at Mad TV, so it's like a institution in comedy TV, uh, Mad TV. And so they met um, Keegan Michael Keyes from Detroit. Uh, uh, Jordan Peele is from New York. Uh, J Jordan Peele went to Sarah Lawrence University and dropped out, I'm pretty sure. Um, these two are just a match made in heaven. It's kind of like a, an Abby Jacobson and Alana Glazer. It's kind of like a, a just like this perfect, like a Keenan and Kel, like just this perfect pair who gets each other and has their own brand of humor just because. Like, like I'm sure that these two met and then immediately just started, started the Key and Peele show. Like just, just, just in conversation with each other, just kicking it, doing full on sketches and skits. So I remember exactly where I was when, when they aired Key and Peele. I remember seeing the promo for it and then being like, oh shit, I got to see this. Because the very first thing that Key and Peele say when they come out and they, and, and it's, if you know the Chappelle show, um, it's very much that it's very much like they come out on a little stage with some screens and they talk about, do a little intro bits and things, and then introduce the sketches. And then they play the sketches on the screens and then like keep talk about it. You know, it's kind of like a presentation stand up routine with pre-recorded clips. So but the the beauty about this was that they both openly were like we are biracial we both have white mothers like we are we're black but we're also white and that i had never ever 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 ever, ever seen acknowledged in that way i remember later 2018 seeing this article about like biracial people in the states um that was in 2018 in the New York Times. So we're we're talking 2012 during the Obama years. And this was the first time I was like, oh, my God, I wonder if Key and Peele felt more open. I felt more willing to express their their biracialness or their mulatto ness or whatever, um, because we had a mulatto president. And that's another. Ugh. I could go down so many rabbit holes right now. Like, I love that that Obama in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of most people, is black, right? Even though we know he had a white mother. Okay, we're not going to go down that road. I'm going to keep it, keep it tied with Key and Peele. But one of the most famous sketches that Key and Peele did was uh, an Obama-related sketch. So if you've never seen Key and Peele... Um, I'll explain it to you. And if you have, how much fun was Luther translator? Like this was like one of the best. So basically, 
um, in, in just, just in case you're not familiar with who these, these people are, cause I, you know, I love them, but if, if you don't know them, Jordan Peele kind of has like a, he kind of has like a teddy bear aesthetic. Like he's a bit on the shorter side and like, he's not like overweight or anything. He's just like kind of round generally. And so, and then Keegan is tall and lanky and he has crazy energy like where Jordan will just kind of be standing stationary and maybe do a karate move or something whatever he's talking about in his sketch Keegan Michael Key will be all up and down the stage back forward on the sides doing all sorts of shit like he's so physical he and he's huge so it made it it made it their stature made the skit that much more funny but essentially Jordan Peele dresses up like Obama and he does a perfect Obama voice it's it's spot on and um and Key Michael Key plays Luther Obama's anger translator excuse me so Obama will be like so we're working on ending the war in Iraq. And Luther will be like, we ended that shit, you motherfuckers. You remember why you did that in the front? Like this kind of dynamic. It's so good. It's so good. I can't do it justice. You got to look it up. And I also read that Comedy Central has a YouTube channel dedicated just for, for Key and Peel. So there were like five seasons of the Key and Peel show. Um, with plenty of sketches and skits and stuff. So if you're interested, you don't have to, you know, subscribe or whatever you can, you can, I, I'll put some skits up on the Patreon. These guys are so funny. Another f- fun thing is that for me being such a huge Jordan Peele fan and knowing that he, you know, helped to write and direct the 2021 Candyman. It's so funny when he talks about certain things that are foreshadowing for his work to come, like, like being the only black person at a party being like a scenario for a sketch or like, which is, is like a scene in get out when Chris is like the only black person there and every, everyone's wanting to auction him off. And, um, and, let's see let's see let's see and with oh yeah yeah yeah, with Candyman yeah and he's talking about he's making jokes about the Candyman and everything and it's like holy shit I mean they say in the skit he's like yeah Candyman is one of my favorite movies uh you know and then goes on and did he did did he already dream of directing a remake of the Candyman? Like, did he already have that aspiration in 2012? Or was it just like he decided to get into movies? And then I'm just, I'm so curious into like the rise. Um, but yeah, oh, Key and Peele, they, they go and they go everywhere with it too. Like they, they dress up in drag as women. They do, um, they, they, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, I don't, I don't even know, like, I don't want to just talk about specific clips. I'm just going to plug it. I'm simply going to plug it that if you need something a little bit funny and a little bit like, yeah, I love, I love the social commentary, but not just social commentary, racial social commentary. And I feel like there's so many confusing and difficult parts about being both, both like African American and white that I, I love that Key and Peele turn it into a superpower and make it like, okay, we can play everything. We can play gangsters in the hood. We can play that like nice uh, gentleman who uh, is dating the white woman and goes to meet her family. Like they just, they slip 
and slink and slide into all these different roles so well. It's so seamless. It's so, it's so genius. And, um, and yeah, I love Key and Peele. They will always be such a huge part of people who I look up, look up to in entertainment and people who are not afraid to, um, represent or comment on race and their own, um, biracial identity. So shout out to Key and Peele. I think it's funny. They, they both ended up marrying white women. Um, just, I don't know, (laughs) random, but, uh, yeah, I would love to work with Jordan Peele one day. So I'm going to put that out there. Uh, Jordan coming for you. Let's do some, some horror shit with the mulatto racial identity. Okay. That's going to wrap up TV and we're going to move into film. Movies. Film. All right. Welcome back to the film section. Low power mode with Breezy. So, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry. Um. All right. So this week in the film section. Uh, it was funny how I got to this director, Janixa Bravo. I was looking at the Met Gala looks with my mom. And we were scrolling through, checking out all the Met Gala looks, essentially booting them or tooting them or shooting them. Uh, shooting them meaning in a good way, like, shoot, that's good. Not shooting. I shouldn't use that word. Ever notice how much like gun uh, language is embedded into our culture? Anyway. um, All right. So I felt like, okay, I loved what Lizzo was wearing. She's probably my top because it was called the, the Met Gala is this The museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Arts in New York puts on this huge gala every year and all these celebrities and famous people and directors and like Hollywood, it's like Hollywood, you know, like a lot of people and music and film and all this stuff come and there's a theme each year and this theme was the Gilded Age and so Lizzo came with like the corset and these like this flowy roby thing with this gorgeous embroidery gold, just like black and gold. And she had her flute with her and I'm sure she was playing flute on the runway. And that for me is just uh, like <laughs> drop, drop the mic, complete mic drop. So Lizzo had it for me, but if I was to wear something, I would wear what Janixa Bravo wore. And it's very, very, very more on like the non-binary side of things. Very like simple, but classy and stylish. And and um, so I was like, who is this person? I, I saw her on the runway. I was like, gorgeous. I, would, I love this. Who is this? And it turns out that she is an American film director. American. I wouldn't have said American because I'm trying to say the states because I feel like American belongs to the natives. Um, But I did read from Wikipedia. So there you go. Uh, Film director, producer, and screenwriter. So she so I was like yeah what's what's her deal what's going on and she was like an army kid you know her father was um or sorry her mother was in the military and so she grew up kind of in between Panama City Panama and Brooklyn New York and um and then eventually got yeah went to a theater school and then went to Tisch NYU, um, New York University Tisch School of the Arts, which, which is like the pipeline to, um, being a successful entertainer in New York. Not the pipeline, it's a pipeline. Um, we always heard stories on the East Coast about people going to Tisch, um, and then you see them on TV. 
So, yeah. So she went to Tisch. She majored in directing and design for theater, including costume and set design. I'm pretty sure her parents were tailors as well. And, um, and so yeah, she started working with uh, uh, Michael Sarah. Actually, no, she started working with Brett Gelman. So I, I guess he's an actor who, um, there we go, actor and comedian. And so she started working with him and did this film called Eat. And I watched, I watched it in this order. I watched Pauline Alone, Eat, and then Gregory Go Boom. So she, she started with, her first film was Eat. And it's about this uh, woman who gets locked out of her apartment and then like her kind of like creepy neighbor and this situation that goes down between them. And she does short films as well. I, or I should mention that like these three films that I saw were all short films, like all around 15, like, you know, somewhere around 15 minutes. So she did that film in... It debuted at South by Southwest Film Festival and was picked up by Vice. And then her second film was the 2013 dark comedy named Gregory Go Boom. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me, this is where Michael Cera sees her, fi her short film and then is like, I want in. Because what I noticed is the th one of the through lines in these films is like, characters who are very unsure around boundaries characters who are um I, I think mentally ill is one way of looking at it but characters who are maybe childlike or awkward or and we all know Michael Cera from I think we all really he first came on the scene with Juno um, the film Juno. And so he wanted in. And so Janixa cast him in Gregory Go Boom. So it's Michael Cera who plays a paraplegic. Um, and it is wild. It is of the three, this is this is the one where I was like, I was like, Whoa. now before I before I give too much about my reaction, um, I thought it was interesting that the 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 title is inspired by this French film, Fr Francois Truffaut. Um, it's called. It's not called Small Change. It's in French, I don't know what it's called, but it's, it's like pocket change is the translation where a boy falls out the window yet survives. So it would be really interesting to go back and watch that. But this was so wild. Okay, so wait, wait, wait. But then I have to mention Pauline alone. So there's that first, there's that neighbor situation and then there's this one where um, Pauline, she's a lonely person and she is going on Craigslist and like trying to meet people based off of what they posted and Craigslist, like where they'll be when, like things like this. So it's a bit disjointed, but it was strange. I don't know. It was, it was wild. Megan Mullally's in there. It was so wild. So then I saw Gregory Go Boom as the third one. And so it starts out where we find out that both um, both Michael Sears' character, uh, sorry, for Michael Sears' character, both his parents are dead, and his older sister, his sister, takes care of him, and and throughout the course of the film, we find out like he's he's a virgin, he's trying to have a sexual experience, which. It's got to be so difficult being a paraplegic. 
and um in the, yeah the people around him are not super sensitive and kind except for like kind of one scenario but no it doesn't end up being kind and so essentially what happens is we kind of like catch him at the end at the very end where he's just done and so at the very very end he <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say the very end something happens that is unexpected and drastic and it's pretty wild and I read the comments underneath because I was like what did other people think about this and I love reading the comments on YouTube, well, especially like when they're like constructive, I don't, I don't like like random, you know, but wh when I go to artist pages, normally it's fans and people who are into it. So it's, it's great to kind of like get their critiques and, um, and yeah, there was, there was one person who, uh, was paraplegic and wa watched the film several times and just like felt like they didn't, they didn't get it and it wasn't like gratifying gratifying for them in any way and it's but uh, you know not not all art needs to be not, not not all art needs to feel good to everyone but I also ask myself like because she's not para paraplegic herself like I wonder like if she thought about like how this speaks to the, the community I don't know I it's very it's very interesting some real food for thought like if you're sick of like that formulaic shit that is on the streaming apps like definitely check out some of Jenna of Bravo's work because it is the it is powerful maybe it's not super politically correct maybe it is at the end, there's, there's a death, but it feels warranted. It feels like there's, it feels, maybe it's not justified. I don't know. And I also feel like there's this element of surrealism always, maybe because I've seen Atlanta <laughs> recently, I'm just like, if anything doesn't make sense, like if there's a plot hole or some something where I'm like, well, would the character really do that though? I'm always like, well, maybe it's just an element of surrealism. <laughs> um, but yeah, okay. So Pauline Alone was the third short film. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's, I don't know, it's wild. And then I was checking out on her Wikipedia page and found out that she actually directed season one, episode nine, June the episode called Juneteenth of the TV show Atlanta. So Donald Glover um, and Janix and Bravo have worked together and that makes so much sense to me. Also, I think at some point I'm going to be circling back to Atlanta because the most recent episode that I saw blew my mind. And, you know, when I talked about it before, I was like on the, I didn't, I don't know. I was just like, kind of disgruntled with it I, I still need to see it through through the rest of the season before I form judgments but yeah opinions can shift I think that's healthy so yeah I'm giving Donald Glover more of a chance <laughs> uh but yeah so that is Janixa Bravo Panamanian uh, black woman, Afro Latin, Afro Latina director, producer, filmmaker, just killing it. Um, I haven't seen her first feature. It's called Lemon, and it came out in 2016. Um, Michael Sears is in it as well. Also, Nia Long is in it. Jillian Jacobs is in it. Megan Mullally. I think it's kind of oh. <laughs> and Marla Gibbs, Marla Gibbs, one of my faves. She, um, she is one of these black actresses who's been in everything. Uh, I got to talk about 227 at some point, but, um, yeah, I'm definitely gonna pay attention to this director because 
she seems like she's just getting started. And I love her dark, weird sense of humor and stuff and shocking. And I don't know. It's interesting. It's interesting. I love sometimes, sometimes I want some form formulaic shit. But sometimes I want stuff to really break the mold. And I haven't seen stuff like hers before. I, there is an artist, Martina Sims, who did an exhibit where there's this like visual component, an animation component that did remind me of the ending of Gregory Go Boom. So I wonder if she took inspiration from that artist. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm appreciating more things that I don't necessarily fully understand. So, <laughs> yeah, that's where I'm at with that. That's going to wrap up the film section. And we are going to roll on over to the outro. <laughs> Hey, listen, sometimes you gotta check in with yourself. Check in with yourself. All right, and we're back. Team Breezy Patrizzi. We are back. I want to thank you all so much for your comments and stuff. I love it. I love it. Thanks for being patient for um, response time. I'm inconsistent, but I do, I will see everyone and, and get back to every like comment and thing. And, um, and yeah, and I love shout out to Daphne. Um, they suggested I post some performance videos on my Patreon and I thought fantastic. Like I love that idea. Um, yeah. Cause it's like, you can, you can try to string together something flashy for Instagram, but I like the, the idea of not having to do that and just posting videos without like trying to crop them to a minute and like these sorts of little, uh, limitations and things and just throw it up and y'all can check it out if you want to. Um, I didn't think about mixing the podcast and the music in that way but it's like yes and since I'm gonna be in Berlin for the last week of May and doing shows and stuff it would be fantastic in case for instance I can't record a podcast um to still provide videos of shows and stuff that I'll do <clears throat> excuse me so that whether or not you can be there you can be there so Thank you so much for your love and support and suggestions. I love it all. And yeah, and I'm listening. Um, today I want to talk about, I just, it's been, it's been tough. Um, you know, the podcast, I always think when things are going well, I'm like, low power mode doesn't really like describe the pot. But then I'm like, when things are hard, I'm like, I love that it's called low power mode. Um, and yeah, this, this past week was a lot. Uh, it's, it's a lot of mental gymnastics my brain is doing or, um, pain, you know, chronic pain kind of like driving you to these places. And I really, um, snapped yesterday and I'm like so I feel so ugly afterwards like a monster and so disappointed in myself and it's so difficult um to yeah to like deal with with these sorts of things I really give a huge shout to anyone with like a a, a registered you know disability and and also those invisible disabilities and things that impact us, that, or impact pe folks that may or may not be qualified as a disability. Um, when you're, when you don't feel physically able on a regular basis, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really challenging. So 
this is one reason why I really, really, really love the um, reigning RuPaul's Drag Champion, Willow Pill, because um, of her, her, um, she deals with cystinosis, this terminal illness, and yet she's really like reclaiming, excuse me, reclaiming her time. I think it's so difficult when you deal with depression and then physical pain on top of it, it kind of feeds into the depression even more and like makes it grip in and sink in even deeper. I think maybe that's what has been going on with me lately, but I'm hopeful, you know, and I'm finally after, let's see, cause I moved to the Bay mid November and that was when I started the process of getting into the healthcare system. And only this week have I been able to book appointments, like get registered, get in the system. So that means that, yeah, it's been a long, like six months or whatever. So I'm hopeful, but also yeah, it's, it's just such a challenge. Like when you're not physically able, planning things is really challenging because you can say, okay, tomorrow I'm going to do this, this, and this, but you might not, you might not be able to do all three things. You may have to choose two. You may have to choose one and maybe you can't do anything. You, you just can't because of your pain or because of your, your mental health, it's, yeah, and, and I think, like, what I'm working on now is accepting that, and being like, okay, okay, it's okay, it's all right, what am I going to do, get mad at my inner child, at myself for being sick, no, absolutely not, um, even though I have, (laughs) um, not anymore, you know, I'm really working on the self-compassion thing. Um, it's made me think a lot about like music. It's made me think a lot about pursuing music and how stressful it's become simply over the past. Cause I really took, took the mental jump in 2018 where I was like, I'm doing this artist thing. And now four years later, it feels like, I mean, the pandemic has really sunk its teeth in, um, for me, the music will always come and flow out of me, but in terms of making a living or, or reaching mental stability, it's like maybe doing, doing this full time, isn't it? Um, I don't feel like I don't want to give up and I'm not going to give up. Um, it's just these considerations, you know, like, like today the doctor was like, you know, make sure that you wake up at the same time every day. And even if you're not going to work, uh, still, um, you know, set your alarm and stuff and that sort of thing. I never have the same schedule from day to day, even as an employee right now, as a part-time employee, still the schedule changes from day to day. So, Like when you work in the arts, when you work in production, it's very fuzzy, like when things begin and end. And I need to do a better job about giving myself rest and boundaries too with working and stuff, but I love it and I want the wheel to continue rolling. So it's really difficult to shut it off. It makes me feel like I'm abandoning my baby. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm still here. I'm still, I'm still going to be coming out to Berlin at the end of the month to perform coming back to Germany in July and August to perform. I'm so thrilled to reconnect with, you know, with, with people, with the community, with the people who show up to my shows and, and, and also the, the vibe of the city and the, the politics and all that. I know Germany is not perfect, but it's looking really good right now. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So thank you for letting me share. I hope this, I hope this wasn't like too much. 
but I always appreciate when other people are honest about what they're struggling with because it makes me feel less alone. And, um, and yeah, and I also, when I zoom out and I, and I think about like some of the things that have happened in the world just in the past couple of years alongside some of the personal risks and things that I've taken, it's like, wow, I would definitely, uh, any, anyone would feel even, even watching those Coachella performances, those famous ass performers were like, yo, it's been so hard, you know, like it's been such a rough two years. It's like, it's really taking a beating, you know? So I don't know if you're feeling tired, maybe you've gotten COVID and now you're, you're functioning at 75% instead of a hundred. Like, I feel you. If, if you have any sort of disease, disorder, disability, any sort of um, thing, thing that you deal with, um, I really feel you. My heart goes out to you, and we're all in it together, and one day at a time, and one foot in front of the other, and all those corny cliches. <laughs> um yeah, okay, I'm going to end it here. I'm delivering this podcast late and it's, a you know, it's on the shorter side, but I want to keep up my one week delivery schedule. So another one will be coming at the end of the week. Thank you for always being patient with me about when these come out and sending so much love to my Patreezy fan. All right, Breezy out. Tschüss. I've been in low, 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 low power mode. In low power mode. Been in low power mode all year. Thing is, how to switch it up to high gear. I've been in low, 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 low. low. I've been in, 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 I've been in, I've been in low power mode all year. Thing is, how to switch it up to high gear.